afternoon. So, at this point, we should start the 10 years of FANG celebration after long preparation. So, I invite Emily to, to come here. And uh, I wanted also to see on the screen Wai Junzu and Chris Tagol, if possible. Yes, hello. Hello, Chris. I don't see you, but I hear you. Wai Jun, are you there? Hello. So maybe you both. OK, so we are actually four FANG co-coordinators. And uh, Chris and Wei Jun are in the US. So Chris, maybe can you start with a couple sentences to introduce you and then Wei Jun to follow? Oh, here you are. Sure. Um, so I'm Chris Tuggle. I'm a professor in um, Iowa State University in the Department of Animal Science. And my interest is. Uh, in immune systems and um, uh, gen regulation of gene expression in the pig, and uh, been serving as co-coordinator of FANG since the beginning. Thank you. Uh, Wei Jun, can we see? Yeah, my you? name is uh, Wei Jun Zhou. I'm a professor in the animal we science We don't see department. you. You don't have, ah, yeah, you are. OK. We see you now. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> yeah. In the animal science department at the University of California, Davis, so I was the program director of the FAN pilot project, uh, work with uh, chicken, pig, and a cattle. And then I'm kind of needing a cattle FAN project. Uh, my primary research interest in is a host pasture interaction uh, in chickens and disease resistance. Thank you a lot. I have to be a you know, coordinator of the FAN for the past 10 years. Yeah. OK. Thanks a lot to both of you. So we are here with Emily Clark, and I will introduce Emily Clark. She's a research group leader at the Rosling Institute in Edinburgh. Uh, her research is on understanding tissue-specific expression and regulation in farmed animal species. With this information, she's working towards improving the link between genotype and phenotype in farmed animals in both tropical and temperate regions. Uh, she's coordinator, co-coordinator of the Eurofang Research Infrastructure Project that started early this year, and led a recent white paper describing the next decade of research priorities for the functional annotation of Animal Genomes Consortium. And she's actually opening this 10-year uh, session. So welcome, Emily. Okay. 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 Oh, okay, great. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth, for the introduction. Um, so on behalf of um, Chris and Hyjin and Elizabeth, I'm going to um, talk about the Fang to Fork research strategy and give a bit of history of Fang um, from the last 10 years and, and introduce the concept of how highly annotated farmed animal genomes um, can improve food security and sustainability. So just to give an overview of what I'm going to cover, so we're going to talk about why understanding the genome of farmed animals is important, give a brief history of FANG and an introduction to the Eurofang and US FANG projects um, that are particularly relevant to, to gene switch, um, and then talk about exploiting functional annotation in, in farmed animal breeding programs very briefly, um, and then um, talk about the FANG to fork research strategy and priorities going forwards for the FANG consortium. So why is understanding the genome of farmed animals important? So the FAO reports that by um, the year 2050, the global human population is likely to reach um, 9.7 billion. Um, and sustainable improvements in efficient production from farmed animals um, to provide healthy food are required to address this huge population growth um, in the human population. So the demand for meat and, and for aquaculture products globally isn't showing any sign of, of slowing down. And we need to focus on sustainable, climate-friendly um, food production from farmed animals. So the challenge is to produce more food using fewer resources in a sustainable way that meets um, societal expectations. So how can highly annotated uh, farmed animal genomes help to meet these challenges? So um, a breeding, pro breeding and management program is a, is a balanced and responsible combination of several traits at a, as outlined by code EFABAR developed by EFAB. Um, in reality, this is actually quite difficult to achieve 
Um, so understanding more about the genetic code of farmed animals or their genomes can benefit um, breeding and can help um, help influence, I guess, breeding and management programs in several different ways. For example, through genome editing, genomics, informing genomic selection. So providing targets for genome editing, I should say, informing genomic selection. Um, in a potential future where, where all high value animals have their genome sequenced, um, using genome enabled management to make management and husbandry decisions. And then also providing more information about fu the fundamental biology of um, farmed animals. So, in order to meet the, the global human population growth and the demands on food production, chief among the improvements required in animal breeding is the ability to more accurately use an animal's uh, genome to predict its phenome, so its genotype to predict its phenotype. Um, so in populations of animals, um, they're made up of thousands of genetic differences um, and hundreds of different characteristics. So we want to be able to associate the genetic code of the animals with their outward characteristics. And animal breeders do that using um, genetic information. What the FANG um, consortium is doing is, is introducing information about the genome um, to generate potentially improved prediction equations and provide um, information about, for example, um, the, the examples I've provided on the previous slide around targets for genome editing and, um, and um, inputting into gen genomic selection. Uh, to lead to better predic prediction accuracy and breed healthier and improved animals, for example, for disease resistance um, and difficult, other difficult to measure and improve traits, um, including reduced environmental impact, um, such as lower greenhouse gas emissions, and then adapting to changing environments. So we're likely to see um, considerably more climate pressure um, in coming decades. So animals that can um, survive under sort of long long dry summers and very long wet winters will probably be more um, suitable, I guess. So advances in the analysis of genome function um, will provide tools and knowledge for the genetic improvement of farmed animals. And the FANG consortium has been working over the last 10 years, I guess, um, to discover basic functional genomic knowledge about the genomes of farmed animals. And this knowledge underpins the genotype to phenotype question across the major farmed animal species. So the first stages of FANG focused on creating comprehensive genome annotation maps for a small number of reference animals. Um, and just to give a, a brief history of FANG, so um, the concept for FANG was, was devised based on the Human ENCODE project where um, we generate a number of different assays to look at genome dynamics and genome function and characterize the different expressed and regulatory regions of the genome, including, for example, using ChIP-seq to look at histone modifications, um, ATAC-seq to look at chromatin accessibility, and then assays um, to look at the transcriptome and DNA methylation. And now, um, since, I guess, the start of FANG, other assays have been developed to look at um, these things that also at a single cell resolution. So FANG was based on the concept um, of the Human ENCODE project, although obviously had much less funding than, than ENCODE did, um, although it managed to achieve a large number of things. Um, and the goals of the FANG consortium were to standardize core assays, so the assays I mentioned on the previous slide, and also experimental protocols, coordinate and facilitate data sharing through the FANG data portal, and establish infrastructures for data analysis. Um, these were to lead to improved farmed animal genotype to phenotype prediction. And in the beginning was to really highly annotate the, the uh, genomes for the main farmed animal species, and then it's evolved from there. So there are major initiatives um, that are sort of linked to FANG or um, specific to FANG. So the US FANG projects that were funded by the USDA, um, and then the Dairy Bio Project in Australia, Genome Canada, AG2PI um, in the U USA, and also the Eurofang Horizon 2020 projects, obviously, of which do Gene Switch is one. And then, as Elizabeth better mentioned briefly before, um, we also have a Eurofang Research Infrastructure Project that was funded earlier this year through Horizon Europe. So FANG started in, in actually 2014, I think, but the first white paper was in 2015, and then there was a similar white paper for the aquaculture um, community in 2017. So FANG is a global initiative, it's a non-institutional organization, it's a community of labs and people, and there are currently around 500 contributors across the globe for FANG. There's a FANG website, and there are multiple different task forces that were launched um, recent, well, relatively recently. Um, so there are six different task forces, one on um, genomic prediction, others on data and um, 
single cell analysis. And anyone can, can sign up to FANG, but you have to also have to sign up to the, the data sharing statement. Um, so the FANG Data Coordination Center is useful for the whole of the farmed animal um, research community. You can download data sets there via links um, to the ENA um, protocols and publications. And there's also a beta version of Track Hubs where you can load um, track visualizations on the genomes that you're interested in from, for example, the Gene Switch project or the Aquafang project. Um, and then there are projects environments for the different uh, Horizon 2020 projects and also ontology resources. Um, and a really important point that a colleague of mine, Ling Zhao Fang, made at the ISAG meeting was that um, you really need to get uh, your metadata correct for these data sets in order for them to have a, an impact. Um, so the FANG data portal was really set up in the beginning of FANG to adhere to a set of metadata specifications and make data, data usable, which is really um, important, I think. Um, so this is a timeline of FANG from starting from 2014 with the Ag Encode workshop. Um, so that's why we're counting from the start. So 10 years will be just ending next year, I guess. Um, so starting with the Ag Encode workshop, and then there was a, a FANG Europe cost action that some of you might remember. Um, and then the cluster of uh, Eurofang projects were funded um, in 2019, and a few more projects joined later. Um, and then there were also several US projects funded um, through the USDA just before the um, Horizon 2020 projects. And Chris Tuggle kindly sent me a, a slide describing the, the pig project that I thought I would present um, for Gene Switch as it's probably the most relevant. So the objectives of that project, which was funded by the USDA and, and led by Iowa State and also um, with UC Davis, um, the overall objective was to catalog uh, the function elements in the pig genome for around 30 tissues from adult and fetal stages. And also they've done a comprehensive characterization of circulating immune cells, um, which is really nice. Um, looking at the different types of immune cell um, and also at single cell resolution in, in immune tissues like this, the spleen. And um, they've also worked with Ling Zhao Fang from the Farm GTEx project to integrate immune cell chromatin states with the pig EQTL data, which is, which is really nice. And there are several manuscripts um, in preparation from that project at the moment. Um, so obviously, uh, given this is the Gene Switch meeting, everybody will be aware of the Gene Switch project and um, the other Eurofang projects, such as Bovreg and, and Aquafang, and the three projects that joined more recently, Geronimo and, and Rumigen and Holoruminant. So the aim of these projects um, was to look at, um, to, to develop um, new information about the genome for, for cattle, five telios, fish species, and pig and poultry. Um, and these projects are all, all wrapping up now, more or less. Um, and these, these projects generated a huge amount of information, and we wanted to build on the foundation that they provided um, in Europe. So um, we submitted a, a funding proposal to the, I think it was the infrastructure concept development call in, in Horizon Europe about, um, and that was funded at, uh, no, about this time last year and then started in January this year. Um, and it was, it's called the Eurofang Research Infrastructure Project, um, and it'll run until 2025. So the Eurofang Research Infrastructure Project has seven different partners, um, including um, several of the contributors to the Horizon 2020 projects. Um, it's coordinated by FBN and co coordinated by the University of Edinburgh. And it includes many planned activities, some of which have all already taken place. So we've had a large number of activities this year, and they're basically um, really set up to improve networking and um, linking genotype, transnational access to genotype. Um, to phenotype research for farmed animals across Europe. Um, so the planned activities include the summer school at INRA in September, think tanks on in vitro systems and, and genome editing. Um, a survey was run by INRA on biobanking and in interconnectivity of biobanks. And there are also, we've had several stakeholder workshops as well over the year. So the Eurofang research infrastructure aims to facilitate research and innovation for G2P research in farmed animals to achieve sustainable and efficient um, farmed animal production and really build on the foundation that was pro provided by the um, Horizon 2020 projects and also has a really strong um, component of global networking and collaboration and we have a global networking event at the Plant and Animal Genomes Conference in uh, January. 
So just to very briefly touch on um, exploiting functionalization in, in farmed animal breeding, because I think there have been several talks on this at the, the meeting so far. Um, so colleagues in Australia have been particularly good at doing this, developing concepts for, for feed scores where you can um, use information, so um, functional genomic information for complex trait prediction, um, and they've done that really effectively in cattle. Um, so the first paper was a, a few years ago now, but more recently they published in Cell, uh, Cell Genomics talking about gene expression and RNA splicing and how you can use that to explain large proportions of her heritability in cattle populations. So they've really led the, led the way in this space. Um, and I sort of adapted this slide from, from Dan McQueen from the Aquafang project and made it more relevant to, to gene switch. So, um, so the gene switch project, I think, is in the context of animal breeding, has generated large numbers of data sets. So matched, um, crucially, they've matched tissues for, for chicken and pig, um, included data for different sexes and developmental stages, multiple different functional assays, um, and EQTLs for different tissue types, and, and also epigenetics and diet interactions. So this is going to lead to millions of novel functional elements for chicken and pig. Um, and they've made all of the data, crucially, they've made all of the data available in the FANG DCC, and that should maximize the impact of the data. The data can be overlaid against, um, for example, the variant effect predictor to look at um, the effects of some of these functional variants to provide novel applications for a better understanding of genotype to phenotype and provide, for example, pre precision breeding tools such as SNP and methylation arrays, um, novel breeding models, and then also epigenetic markers. Um, and these will lead to more sustainable and profitable breeding, hopefully, and increased genomic prediction um, and accuracy for a range of traits enhanced management and improved animal welfare in the, in the future. And I think this was the, sort of the core goal of all of the Eurofang projects and probably also the projects in the US to um, reach this stage. So just to briefly summarize then, so outcomes potentially for animal breeding are enhanced genomic prediction and accuracy, so farmers can make better decisions or um, I guess more accurate decisions based on um, knowledge of the genome. Um, and Functional genomic data is also important for conserving genetic diversity, both at regional and global scale. So the Bovreg project looked at um, different populations of cattle in that context. Um, and then also that should lead to improved farmed animals for health, welfare, and productivity. Um, and that's important because it's a key component of the, the farm to fork um, strategy outlined by the EU for sustainable food production. Um, so just to briefly summarize the FANG to Fork research strategy and the priorities for FANG going forward. So um, as Elizabeth mentioned in the introduction, so um, a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago now, we, we published a paper um, outlining a strategy for, for the FANG consortium for the next 10 years called the FANG to Fork strategy um, with a number of, of collaborators across the, across the globe. So it, lay, it lays out a framework for research linking genotype to phenotype in farmed animals for the coming decade. And it has three main components, generating norm, more knowledge about the genetic code of farmed animals to make informed breeding decisions, building maps of gene expression and gene regulation for each farmed animal species, and that could be, um, uh, for example, at cellular le level resolution, and then providing information about fundamental biology to link cell tissue and whole animal scale knowledge um, in farmed animals to inform genome editing, genomic selection, and, and really understanding more about um, the genome. So it had six main research priorities, um, and they were focused on building tools and resources for new breeding technologies. So for example, using high throughput screens to highlight targets for genome editing, um, using pan genomes and comparative genomics to provide information for many breeds to preserve and utilize genetic diversity, building information for large cohorts of animals, um, and linking gene expression information, information at scale to genotype information. And colleagues in the Farm GTEx project have done that um, particularly well um, for a number of farmed animal species now. Generating large collections of, of phenotypes and building biorepositories as resources for research and conservation, and also developing, um, as I mentioned previously, single cell level resolution tissue maps. So I just want to take this opportunity to, to um, give an example of a project that matches those priorities so, um, and also introduce it as a, a new project um, to this consortium because it might be um, useful and, and relevant. So um, with colleagues in the US at Iowa State, USDA in Michigan, and also colleagues 
um, in, the, in the Netherlands, we're working on generating a telomere to telomere genome assembly for a pig. Um, so we're using a, a, or we collected tissues from a Hampshire fire across a large white land race um, dam and generated an F1. And we collected tissues from a day 72 male fetus for this project. So just a, a relatively small number of, of tissues. Um, and we are generating the, a new the telomere, telomere assembly based on, um, based on this cross. So we're generating Illumina short read whole genome sequencing information from both the parents and using a tree opening approach um, to generate the new assemblies, I should say. So an assembly for the sire and also the dam. And then also generating hi-fi reads um, and ultra long, ONT ultra long sequencing. Um, and then also a, a high resolution transcriptome annotation based on the tissues. So the USDA are generating the assembly. Currently, Rosalind are working on the transcriptome. Um, Iowa State are using, uh, are generating um, single cell resolution RNA-seq data. Um, and Michigan State and, the, and colleagues in, in the Netherlands, Martin and others are working on the pan, on the pan genome for a pig. So the current assembly statistics for the, for the genome look a bit like this. So we use two assembly strategies, and most of this work, I should say, or all of this work has been done by Ben Rosen and Tim Smith at the USDA. So we use two assembly strategies, Virco and Hi-Fi SM. Um, and at the moment, so, so these are not quite the most up-to-date ones. So um, at the moment, using Virco, um, 16 uh, chromosomes are T to T. Actually, when we run Hi-Fi SM in um, scaffolding mode, the um, maternal haplotype, there are actually only two chromosomes that aren't T to T. So it's, it's all there, and that's chromosome 15 and 16. I think they're both accentric chromosomes, and one's very large and one's very small. So we're almost there with the maternal haplotype. For the paternal haplotype, there are 13 chromosomes that are T to T at the moment. There's also a large inversion on chromosome six, uh, 15, which is really odd, and we're trying to resolve that at the moment using optical mapping data because it's only present in the sire haplotype and not the maternal haplotype. Um, so there's some interesting things about that. And please do get in touch with us if you would like to be part of the project. There's um, specific things um, that can, that sort of would be useful to look at. Um, and we're always happy to, um, for, to sort of share, I guess, share the work for this one. Um, and it'd be a community-based effort. So the pig t t project, I thought was a good example of, of generating new genomic resources for pig pan genome projects, um, generating a highly contiguous reference um, of, uh, for prediction of regulatory elements, such as the pig um, GTEx project. Um, culturing, we're going to culture, well, we have cultured embryonic fibroblasts as a non-finite resource for, for DNA and also for biobanking. And then, um, obviously, the uh, Christus group at Iowa State are generating the single cell uh, resolution information. And then we hope that having a new genome of this contiguity for pig and unlocking some of the regions that we've have previously been difficult um, will provide new targets and resources to inform genome editing. So just to summarize then, so the priorities for FAN going forward, so to generate functional genomic information for additional developmental stages, breeds, and populations, building on the work that's already been done and leveraging expertise, for example, in the farm GTEx project and others. Um, this will help us better predict the genotype to phenotype relationships, and, we'll and moving forward, generating population scale information will help translate the FANG research out of the laboratory and into industry application in the field. What's needed is public investment, international collaboration, and training of new scientists um, to expand genotype to phenotype, phenotype research um, in Europe and also globally. So this will contribute to the genetic improvement of farmed animal populations to meet the challenges um, faced for food production in the future and allow us to harness the power of functional genomic variation and turn it into sustainable genetic gain. So just to summarize, um, obviously we're celebrating the 10, year, 10 years of FANG at the moment and there are various um, conferences coming up including the um, Global Fang Workshop at PAG in San Diego in January. Um, the Bovreg Project will have its final meeting here in the University Foundation in Brussels in February. Um, EMBL EBI as part of the Eurofang initiative are running a livestock genomics course, um, which is really targeted at early career researchers. Um, and then also we have an open call for papers and a special issue of genomics um, at the moment. So please, if you have 
papers, please consider submitting those there. Um, and thank you, everyone, for your attention. Also, to we have recovered five minutes of the delay, <laughs> so thanks a lot. I don't know if there are any questions, uh, also online, but probably people know quite well, so we can maybe advance. Uh, so now what happens is that we have uh, four summary talks that are uh, aimed to recap what uh, was discussed yesterday afternoon and this morning when US people could not be connected. And after that, maybe we will be able here to still grab a coffee, but at 16.45, we should have the roundtable discussions and uh, that will end the day. So the first person is Martin Darks, that is here. Okay, thank you. Um, so my name is Martin Derks, and I'll give kind of a, a summary talk of some of the work that we've been doing in uh, Work Package 2. Um, I will not e uh, reiterate all the things that we also mentioned uh, yesterday, so all the, the work on, on methylation, uh, ATAC-seq, gene expression, but I'll try to give a glimpse on some of the integrative work that we're trying to do now. Um, so we have had some issues with uh, the ChIP-seq data, so we had some delays uh, before we got the ChIP-seq data, but uh, over the last months uh, we received the data and we, we tried to make some, some first analysis on, on integrating the ChIP-seq data together with uh, the, the ATAC-seq and also gene expression. So I'll show a bit about that uh, in, in this uh, presentation. However, this is very much uh, ongoing work. Um, as we are also still doing some QC on some of the ChIP-seq marks. Um, so just to, to, to show uh, how many samples we have, so for chicken we have uh, 78 samples in, in total, comprising four uh, ChIP-seq marks and, and two controls. Um, so we have uh, two uh, tissues, so we have muscle and liver. Uh, we have three biological replicates, only for liver we have, uh, for one we have four. Uh, so that sums up to a total of uh, 18 or 24 samples um, per, per tissue um, and time point. So these four ChIP-seq marks, uh, I'm not sure if everybody knows, but uh, so the first mark is uh, H3K27 acetylation. So this is a mark that is uh, linked to um, active enhancers and also active promoters. We have H3K27 uh, tri uh, trimethylation which is a mark that is linked to uh, suppression of, of gene expression. We have H3K4ME1, uh, so this is a mark that is linked to active and also post uh, enhancers. And also H3K4 um, trimethylation, which is a mark which is enriched for uh, active promoters. So um, I analyzed the data, and um, for most of the, the samples it looked good. So this is the peak count, and we got uh, well, we, we got um, a lot of peaks, as expected. Uh, however, we had uh, two samples. Um, uh, so it was from the, the muscle newborn. So you see below, you see that we have some samples where we see basically no, uh, no peaks. So unfortunately, these failed, but still I think the others uh, looked uh, quite good. Uh, we also checked the, the, the number of um, um, fragments that were identified in peaks. So this is the FRIP score which is also a measure of the quality of the, the ChIP-seq data. And there we saw that uh, for most of the, the, the samples it was good, again, except for the, the muscle uh, newborn. And, and this is specifically for, for chicken. Um, and, and also for the other samples, as mentioned, the, the FRIP scores were, were quite good. Um, for pigs, we actually have even more samples. So for pigs, we have three tissues. So we have liver, muscle, and, and kidney. Uh, we have uh, four samples, uh, times six marks, uh, times three developmental stage. So that sums up to a, a total of 72 uh, samples. So again, this is a, a pretty good data set uh, to do some uh, integrative analysis. Also here we did some, some QC, and we saw that uh, here again you see the number of peaks that we called, and here you see that um, for the kidney and the muscle at 30 days, so that's the first stage, um, we saw basically no peaks, so unfortunately these, um, these failed. 
But for the, other, for the others, uh, again, we got good, uh, good results. So we got good peak counts and also good FRIP scores. Um, so one of the, the things that we, the, with, that we want to do is, is to uh, do epigenomic state prediction. Uh, so there's a tool called uh, Chrome HMM. Uh, so you can basically um, feed it with these different uh, chip seek marks from these different samples. So we excluded the samples that we, um, well, that had bad quality or failed or that we were doubting about. So we want to make sure that at least uh, the, the epigenomic states that we could predict uh, are of high quality. Also in this epigenomic state prediction, uh, we, uh, you can put in the attack seek data. <coughs> And in the end, we want to do this to be able to investigate switches in epigenomic states. So we want to see if there are switches in epigenomic states between certain uh, developmental uh, time points. And in the end, we also want to relate that uh, to gene expression. So, um, so the Chrome HMM actually predicted, in this case, uh, 12 uh, states. And I think the results uh, look uh, relatively good. Uh, so the first state is a, is a poised enhancer, so there we see enrichment for the H3K4 uh, monomethylation. The second one is an active enhancer, but we don't see any attack uh, signal there. Uh, the third and the, the tenth state were uh, basically we, we, did, we didn't see any overlap with any of the, the marks and also not with the, uh, the chip, uh, with the attack seek. And this is actually also most of the genome, so we also see that in the next slide. Um, so state four is actually shows an active, a strong active enhancer. So you have um, basically um, enrichment of uh, K4 um, trimethylation, K27 acetylation, and K4 uh, monomethylation. So this is a clear indication of an active uh, enhancer. So states five to seven are uh, states which are close to an active TSS or are showing uh, at least parts that are transcribed. Um, State eight is active transcription start site, so we see a very strong enrichment of uh, H3K4 uh, trimethylation, um, as well as uh, ATAC. <clears throat> State nine is an ATAC island, so we don't see anything on the chip seek marks, but we do see clearly an uh, ATAC signal. Um, and then uh, state 11 is uh, showing repressed state, so that's the K27 uh, trimethylation. And state 12 is uh, poised uh, transcription uh, start site. Um, we also looked a little bit uh, into the transitions between the, the different uh, developmental states and tissues. So we, is, we saw a few transitions that happened a bit more often than, than uh, let's say, others. So we saw some enrichment of different transitions. So one of them was, for example, uh, Atak Island to Cuisant, um, and also, for example, strong active enhancer to active enhancer without Atak. So these are some of the, 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 the transitions that we observed uh, if you compare the, the different tissues uh, and time points. However, this is all quite preliminary and we, we really have to, to dive into these results uh, in more detail. Um, one of the things we also want to do is of course related then to gene expression. So if you have a change in epigenomic state, you would expect that it would also reflect in, in differences in gene expression. Um, so if you look at the, uh, the percentage of the genome that is covered in these different states, so you see that state 10, which is basically a state where we didn't see any chip seek or attack uh, enrichment, is most uh, abundant. Um, you see that state 8, which is the active transcription start site, uh, is really enriched around, um, well, uh, the transcription start site uh, and also around uh, the genes. Um, and also you see that these states five to seven, which are states indeed surrounding the transcription start site that are transcribed. So you do see also enrichment there um, for some of these states. Um, so again, this is really the, the beginning of trying to do some integrative analysis. So we, we are still doing some QC on the ChIP-seq data. Um, we have some marks that we sus suspect that might be a different um, um, mark than, than, was in, than what was initially planned. Um, subsequently, I will do a differential epigenomic state prediction. So I want to see, okay, where are the, the basically the switches in epigenomic states? Um, and then also link that to gene expression across development. And with that, I would like to uh, thank you.
Right, thank you. Um, so my talk, the focus of my talk today is um, to introduce you briefly to the annotation we have in Ensemble, um, especially what we've done for the Gene Switch project. So for those who don't know, Ensemble is both a genome browser but also a source of annotation for very many species. So we have a number of different types of annotation from gene annotation, variants, comparative views, and also regulatory annotation. And so the primary thing I'm going to just cover in this short talk is the gene annotation, which has been done by the gene build team. They offer annotation for very many species in a standardized way. There's also more species for those who are interested on the companion site rapid.ensemble.org. And uh, they've provided updated gene annotation for pig and chicken using the short and long read transcriptomic data, which has also been refined using protein alignments and also uh, some views from human annotation. Ensemble regulation is, is my team, and we've looked at, um, because of the funding really from Aquafang and GeneSwitch, we've been able to go beyond um, annotation for human and mouse for the first time, and uh, we've then updated our pipeline infrastructure and methods, but also, of course, um, now have annotation for, for chicken and pig. So first, just some of the gene annotation. Um, as you probably know, so uh, in release 107 from Ensemble, the gene annotation for the um, pig reference was re-annotated using the gene switch data. Um, also in chicken, uh, there's the new reference genome, which was, re which was annotated then using the gene switch data. And the previous assembly has also been re-annotated. So all of that was updated um, during um, for 107. This is outside of gene switch, but it's good to know that there are also like 12 other breeds of pig available annotation on the main site. And you also have another two chicken breeds. And then going on to what I mentioned, the sort of rapid.ensemble.org uh, site, there's a further two chicken breeds and another eight um, pig breeds coming during this month. Right, so then on to regulation. Um, so. As I think we've seen in a number of these talks, our focus has been to use the gene switch data in these seven different tissues, three different developmental stages, female and male giving sort of 42 what we call epigenomes or biosamples. Um, but we've also supplemented these with the work from also another FANG project, the Kern et al. publication, which is largely done out of UC Davis with Arjun as the last author. This is another eight tissues in the adult and so we have then sort of a summary of the experiments there at the bottom. We have open chromatin. Uh, we also then have those histone marks coming from the UC Davis work as well as CTCF. And then you can just see a summary in terms of sort of the alignments that we've done with that data. So that then is our primary analysis pipeline. And then using that primary analysis pipeline, we then provide the regulatory annotation so we have regulatory annotation for 110, which is out at the moment. Um, that's largely open chromatin chrom and promoters. We've refined our approach um, and also using the UC Davis data of histone marks. We now also have enhanced annotation. This is um, ready to be released, but it's in 111, which is not out yet. It's due towards the end of this month. Okay, so for the last part of the talk, I just thought I'd take a sort of a bit of a practical walkthrough just to illustrate what the annotation looks like and how you might use it. So this is um, sort of a classic way into Ensemble, which would be the region in detail view here. Um, so it's a view in, the, in this case in chromosome one. You'll see um, sort of a summary of the genes towards the top as well as a sort of regulatory build track, which is the enhancers and promoters. You'll see a sort of red rectangle there, and then that's the sort of region in, in more detail at the bottom that you can see. The key thing just to draw your eye to is the sort of yellow box there around configure this page, and this is where you can add some tracks of interest um, to customize to what you're interested in. So, this brings up a window sort of like this, where you have a number of different categorized tracks. The ones of interest for today is the top one there, which is the sort of gene annotation um, models that you can have a look at. And then the one below is regulatory annotation, both the regulatory build, which is the 
main sort of regulatory elements or features, but also the primary data, which is the features by cell tissue, which as I'll show you is pretty key to being able to interpret um, the annotation correctly. Right, so quick sort of view of the gene um, annotation tracks you can get. So there's the consensus model, um, different transcript models that you can have a look at. There's also time um, and tissue specific um, models that you can view, summary of read alignments, some intron spanning reads, and then also some of the models generated from the sort of PAC bio long read um, data as well. Right, so that's gene annotation. Obviously, please explore further to see what's there. But you, um, and then now into regulatory annotation, which you might be a bit less familiar with. Um, so at the top there is, is the transcript annotation that you can get from the gene track. You'll see there's sort of poten multiple potential transcription start sites. Now, if you go down below, you'll see the track with the sort of red, yellow, and gray. These are the regulatory annotations. There's a legend just at the bottom. So the red is promoter. And you'll see a few promoters there aligning with the um, putative transcription start sites. And then the enhancers are potential regulatory regions based on overlap also with chromatin um, data. And then the gray, the open chromatin is essentially unclassified uh, either because there's insufficient um, histone marks supporting it, but in, in some cases, for example, overlapping an exon, so we'd rather just keep it unclassified um, as open chromatin. Right, you can actually click on one of these features and then you'll get sort of a pop-up window. And from them, there there's an ID, which is also a link you can follow. And the key thing from there is you can get a sort of summary of activity for that particular regulatory feature across the different epigenomes that, that we have. Now, um, the key thing to understand here is that these activities are based on peak detection. So in essence, um, if we see, for example, on the left-hand one, which is the, the promoter, the red one, we'll see a peaks have been detected in all of the liver samples. This is for the plasminogen gene. Um, and also in the um, UC Davis sort of adult um, lobe of liver um, tissue as well, but not in any other tissues. Um, if you look then across towards the enhancer, you will see um, many sort of uh, detected again in liver, but we also have some indication of peaks being detected in kidney, the mesonephros, which is the early kidney, small intestine. Now, now, it's worth noting that sometimes you might get a false positive. Perhaps that's the case here with the small intestine, perhaps not. In fact, I think in general, it's actually be false negatives, which will be more of an issue. And that's important to understand is that if you, for example, had an experiment that didn't work very well, or there was a lot of noise in it, then the threshold for significance is not going to be reached. And so you're gonna end up with greatly reduced peaks in certain uh, tissues. These will come through then as no peaks detected, and you'll get some indication potentially of uh, non-activity, so to speak. But just to bear in mind, this is more of um, not reaching statistical significance rather than being evidence of no activity. So, and also bear in mind that some loci are very clearly distinct categories of act active and inactive, but others have a more sort of continuum of measurements, and in this case, it's pretty difficult to separate into two classes. So I think just, just a quick interlude to help with the interpretation, um, just so you know what the annotation is giving you and what it's not giving you. And I think the ultimate goal is that it can guide you to the primary data that might be of interest for further interpretation. And so that's where you go back to this configure this page. You can now, for example, choose these liver um, epigenomes of interest, the kidney, et cetera. This is on the um, tab there on the left, which is the cell and tissue. You can then go across to experiments and choose attic seek and chip seek and so on. You can then um, configure it, um, for example, the top three. I'm only choosing a few so it can fit on the page. But you can, for example, pick the gen gene switch specific top three, and then the um, Kernetel UC Davis um, histone marks for the bottom. You can look at the signal and peaks. And so it would be nice to have a pointer, but you'll just have to um, follow my description here. But you'll see that we have the sort of longish red promoter, 
If you go down below there, you will see there's two tracks where we have a clear peak where the signal is really standing out. These are in the two um, liver samples, male and female, and you'll see how very reproducible they are, which is, I think, suggestive of good quality data. So it can give you some confidence um, in, in that specific um, uh, data set. You'll have that there's no um, clear, no peak called for the um, top one, which is kidney, but if, you, um, if it's not too small, there's actually a small little um, signal there. So this is something to, for example, suggest that perhaps a subpopulation of kidney cells might have activity, or perhaps the threshold is just, the background is a bit higher, just there could be some kidney activity. So it's just something to bear in mind. And if you look across at the enhancer, uh, the yellow one, on the right, there you're getting activity coming clearly through in both liver and kidney. Um, and then going down to the bottom where you see this is coming from the UC Davis data. Firstly, very nicely, the ATEC-seq from a totally separate experiment lines up very nicely with the ATEC-seq from GeneSwitch, which I think gives a lot of confidence that these are indeed likely to be regulatory elements. You also see the classic marks for uh, HGK27 acetylation for activity is coming through, the marks for um, enhancer, the marks for promoter. Um, so I think you can have a fair degree of confidence in this particular locus. Not every locus is gonna look this clean, but at least it can give you an idea of how you might uh, go about interpreting um, this data. Looking then at a sort of hopefully homologous uh, situation in chicken, you'll see that the promoter region is a little bit longer and less distinct. Um, it's, uh, this could be because of data, but it could also be as in Kernatal where they talk about the sort of lower number of enhancers per gene in chicken. Um, perhaps the regulatory features, the regulatory um, sort of uh, sequences are actually more closer to the promoter in this case. There is a um, enhancer, I mean, an open chromatin that's sort of lying in the overlapping gene. Uh, this one is something also to consider because I think the activity is coming out as being potentially in liver. Uh, that gene that's overlapping, sometimes also a thing for annotation, is you get transcripts which overrun, and so you can lead to an extended uh, transcript which might not um, always actually be representative of what you're getting. So the, the, up, the, the overlapping gene might not typically overlap. So. Anyway, that's hopefully just at least a quick flavor of the type of regulatory annotation we have, how you might approach it, the importance of, of looking at the primary data and just using it as a guide um, for further understanding. There's more help and documentation available, so on the RAPID site for gene build, on the main site for regulation, but please feel free to contact us if you have any questions or want to understand something in more detail. Um, so we're part of a larger group. This is bigger than Ensemble. It's, it does all sorts of genome analysis work, but just to acknowledge the wider team that we're part of, and also, of course, to thank the funders, which, without which this work wouldn't have been possible. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so what I will do is I will give a, a quick summary of what, has, what we have done in work package four of GeneSwitch. So this is the work that we've undertaken with the entire work package four uh, team. So we, just to recap, the, our aim here was to, uh, to extend genomic prediction models to, to try and make a use of, uh, of functional annotations to boost the uh, predictions. And we, we achieved this in uh, three different ways. First of all, we worked on developing the models. Uh, then we also additionally uh, generated new data in the project, both for uh, FindMap QGL in chicken and eQGL in pigs. And then we went on to validate uh, uh, the models that we had developed in large-scale uh, commercial data. So just to put that all together, traditional genomic prediction models, they just use genotypes and phenotypes. We topped this up with the functional annotation maps coming from work package one and two, and for the chicken with fine map QGL and for the pigs with eQGL. And then we put this in, uh, in large scale validation uh, to see what we could get additional uh, using these approaches. 
Um, so uh, briefly on the, the Bayesian uh, models and the machine learning models that we've worked with uh, in Work Package 4, uh, with the, uh, uh, what we saw is with the machine learning models that we were actually able to better predict phenotypes of traits that were um, affected by, uh, by epistatic effects. Uh, whereas uh, for the po polygenic traits, so this is probably most of the traits that we're interested in in animal breeding, the traditional linear G-blood models uh, were able to outperform the, the machine learning models. Then uh, we uh, briefly looked into the use of individual gene expression, uh, where we found that actually individual gene expression, so having it measured on all the individuals where they actually want to predict their performance, that the gene expression was uh, a much better predictive predictor for individual uh, phenotypes than uh, SNP genotypes are. Um, but, but yeah, we also have to note that uh, while this seems very promising, uh, the, the question is whether this is feasible in practice. Uh, so a number of hurdles need to be overcome, like the cost of getting those, uh, those uh, omics on individual animals is probably uh, too high at the moment. Uh, and you also need to have standardized protocols. When are you going to measure it, and which tissue, et cetera, to make sure you don't create a lot of additional variation uh, which may not have any predictive uh, power. Um, and then uh, finally, so these uh, Bayesian uh, uh, models where the people at NRA has work, have worked on, uh, there uh, the uh, previously developed BASE-RC model was uh, developed in two different directions, uh, namely this BASE-RC pi and this BASE-RC plus model. Uh, the, the software for that has been developed, is freely available on, uh, on GitHub, uh, and based on that, on our experiences, uh, so if we applied that, we saw that for some trades there was a marginal increase, uh, but it also led us to believe, okay, what if we have all these different annotation maps? Uh, how do we stack this all together? Uh, and what is the resolution that we need uh, to get more out of this? So, um, as I said, one of the things that we did is, uh, what well, this is work done at ETA in Spain, is uh, generate um, uh, EQTLs on uh, pigs. So there was uh, 300 pigs, 100 pigs of each of three populations of different breeds. Uh, those animals were all sequenced and uh, gene expression, RNA-seq, was obtained from three uh, different tissues, uh, as you can see here. And the EQTL analysis are, uh, generated a lot of EQTL regions, more than 20,000, that then also have been consolidated back to a limited number of, uh, of hotspots. Uh, we have used this as an annotation map in large-scale validation, and it turned out that this was one of the more predictive or more useful uh, functional annotation map, along with some other uh, expression uh, data. So, um, in addition to the EQTLs in uh, pigs, there was the fine mapping activity in, uh, in chickens. And the basis of this work was this, this very long-term experiment where there was bidirectional selection uh, for body weight at eight weeks of age, as you can see in the, in the graph here. And then at some stage, the low line and the high line, they were uh, mated with each other for several generations to get in this advanced uh, intercross line. And there, there was uh, about 40 QTL that were uh, met with quite high resolution. And the, uh, uh, those QTL regions were then compared to the functional annotations uh, generated within gene switch, but also from some other sources. Uh, showing some, providing some interesting insights as uh, Carl Johan presented earlier today. Then the final task in uh, Work Package 4 was to do this uh, validation in commercial populations. So this is sort of the proof of the pudding. Uh, the problems of the project was we're going to generate all this functional annotation. And one uh, potential uh, use of it is to put it in genomic prediction uh, and bo boost its prediction accuracy. So we said when we were developing the project, let's try and validate this in, uh, in real life uh, commercial scale populations. So the, um, what we did here, we had uh, the annotation maps, uh, we had uh, the additional QTL, 
Um, the thing is that this data is at uh, base pair resolution, whereas commercial data typically is not. So you may have tens of thousands of individuals in breeding programs that are genotyped for 50,000 SNPs, uh, but we don't have it at base pair resolution. Uh, at the same time, those individuals likely do have uh, phenotypic information. So um, starting from this 50K uh, SNP genotypes, then in uh, both a, uh, a population of broilers and a population of pigs, these genotypes were uh, imputed up to whole genome sequence um, using a, uh, a set of individuals where the whole genome uh, uh, was or was sequenced. So for example, in pigs, it's the 100 uh, animals of the same breed as in the large scale population that were used uh, for the imputation process. So then after that step, we had the genotypes at base pair resolution and we could merge that information with the, uh, with the annotation maps. Um, so I'll just quickly uh, summarize the results of the validation in the, the pig population that was presented by, uh, by Bruno earlier today. So there the approach was to do this, uh, this FAT score uh, to, to use that. Basically what it, it, it does, it, it allows to, uh, to bring in as many different layers of functional information as you have available. In this case, actually 32 layers were all put together uh, in, the same, in the same model. And then uh, this is what the, top, the graph at the top right here shows. Well, it's too, too small to, to actually read, but what you can see is the ones that rank at the, tom, at the top, and those are mostly maps related to gene expression. They have the highest FAT scores, and they contribute most to which SNPs eventually are being selected to be used in the genomic prediction model. Um, so, so yes, it was this expression uh, data, but also the QTL maps that uh, proved uh, to be most informative. They ranked the highest. And then if we looked at uh, the accuracy that was gained with this, we could see that for some of the traits, and that's in the, the uh, plot in the uh, bottom right corner, uh, when comparing, let's say, a, a random panel of SNPs with a panel of SNPs uh, selected based on this FAT scores, we saw for a number of traits that there was a marginal improvement of a few percent in accuracy. And uh, as Andreas also showed in the validation in the, in the chicken data, there was a similar marginal improvement seen as well uh, when selecting the SNPs based on the functional annotation. So uh, in terms of uh, output, other than, of course, all the knowledge and the insights that we have generated, uh, to date, five uh, papers were published uh, on the development of the uh, base RCO uh, software, uh, on the EQTL analysis, and also on the, the comparison of the, the GBLAB with, uh, with the machine learning and with the use of the individual uh, expression uh, profiles in, in this MICE data. And this, uh, as I said, this base RCO package was developed and is freely available and can be downloaded from, uh, from GitHub. So, and of course, there's a, there's a few more papers to come, especially for the, the tasks on the commercial validation that started later in, in the project. So to, uh, to wrap up, uh, the main take home messages of work package four is that uh, well, we had a very important focus on model development, uh, and that has uh, generated this base RCO software that's freely available. It also generated the insight that uh, machine learning models, as we actually had expected beforehand, uh, may be better able to explain phenotypes that are uh, known to have epistatic uh, underlying uh, architecture, whereas polygenic traits can be better predicted with straightforward G-blood models. Then uh, the individual level gene expression um, actually explained a considerable amount of variation in the phenotypes, uh, which seems, uh, seems pretty encouraging. It was sort of dependent on what is the moment in time when you get the expression data and when you predict uh, the phenotype. So for the QTL mapping, we did this, uh, there was eQTLs for pigs and fine map QTL in chickens. Um, and that then subsequently could be used in this large-scale uh, validation 
uh, of genomic prediction. And there we saw that uh, in both the, the pig and the poultry uh, application that there was a marginal increase of using functional annotation uh, in genomic prediction. So that's just very brief, yes? Next talk is uh, Jerry Wells, who is online. So, Jerry, are you there? Yeah, thank you. Thanks thank you. So, can I share my screen for the presentation? Because it will be easier for me to uh, change slides. So, so. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to give you an, uh, a, a short summary of the work in Work Package 5. Uh, and it's the work of the whole team who I will uh, acknowledge at the end. And um, we, in this study, we were looking at epigenetic effects of uh, the cell diet on uh, the fetus and on piglets. I'll quickly describe the setup in a moment, but just to remind you something about dietary fiber, which was the, the difference we had in the, in the, uh, in the cell diets. Um, dietary fiber, which is non-digestible, passes to the colon, and in the colon it's fermented by the microbiota. And in fermenting uh, non-digestible uh, fiber, they produce uh, mainly, short -chain fed, uh, mainly the short-chain fatty acids, acetate, propionate, and butyrate. These can reach quite high concentrations in the colon, uh, there are transporters and they can be transported across the epithelium um, and then go through the portal vein to the liver. Um, many, the butyrate is produced in the least amounts uh, and it's also used as a fuel by the colonocytes, but acetate uh, reaches the portal vein in higher concentrations and uh, propionate about yeah, roughly 10 times less than, than acetate. I mean, once it's been through the liver, it can come uh, back into the uh, circulation through the arteries. And um, short-chain fatty acids are known key regulators of uh, peripheral and systemic uh, immune responses. Um, they signal to many types of cells through signaling pathways involving the FR fatty acid receptors, or also known as GPRs, 41, 43, and there's others as well. But um, there's also growing evidence uh, for the epigenetic effects, which was our interest in work package five. So um, short chain fatty acids can enter cells uh, via the monocarboxic acid uh, transporters or similar transporters. And um, uh, acetate in particular, uh, because it, it, it's, uh, it, it's highest in abundance, but also converted to acetyl-CoA, um, activates the AMP kinase, which can acetylate histidine acetyl transferases and activate them. Um, propionate and butyrate in particular have been reported as HDAC inhibitors. They inhibit the activity of HDAC, and it's still unclear how they do that. It's not a direct inhibition of those enzymes. Okay, um, yeah. Uh, uh, next to, yeah, there's, there is a evidence before we started in work package five that there are epigenetics of short chain fatty acids. This comes from work in germ-free mice. They grew up carboretel, which published some years ago. So the, in, in a germ-free mice, uh, there is a big difference in the, in the histone acetylation and also methylation in multiple tissues. Uh, and by supplementing germ-free mice with mixtures of short chain fatty acids, Approximate, approximating to the concentrations which are found in conventional mice, uh, they could recapitulate a lot of these modifications. So that's more evidence about epigenetic effects of uh, short-chain fatty acids. So our hypothesis were that um, epi we would get epigenetic effects from, uh, from diets which are high in fibers that are fermented by the microbiota, that uh, we might detect those epigenetic effects in the pig offspring up to at least 10 weeks postpartum. Uh, when the piglets after birth are put all on a low fiber diet. So the high fiber diet is only given to the south. Um, and uh, 
We also predicted or hypothesized that the effects of the maternal high fiber diet uh, would be detected at the level of transcriptional and chromatin accessibility. Um, so this was the, the study. We had seven cells in each group. Uh, we had a high fiber which comprised a beet pulp with a low amount of, uh, of sugar, sugar uh, a pea fiber, uh, and also a low fiber, which does contain some fiber, but um, relatively low amounts compared to the others. And there were two males and females taken, and um, we collected a biorepository, and the target tissue was liver and skeletal muscle, of which we performed RNA-seq and uh, ATEC-seq. Um, in the study, there were different genetic lines. Uh, they're shown here. Um, so, um, yeah, it was not only, not only uh, uh, one type, one, one bore line, but also but two. Uh, so that was uh, something we had to take account of in the statistics of the of the data analysis. So firstly, just to tell you what happened uh, with the dietary intervention. So looking at the, the microbiota from, from some cell feces, we saw that uh, there were differences in the microbiota as expected uh, for the cells on the high fiber uh, uh, diet, pea diet and the high fiber beet pulp diet compared to the low fiber. And you see some of the eubacterial species in here, which are the, the butyrate producers, which are typically in, increased in relative abundance as a result of high fiber in the diet. There were no significant differences in the short chain fatty acids in the, in the cell blood. Um, it's something that's very, very much dependent on, um, on timing. Uh, when this study started, uh, it was the lockdowns from COVID, it was right at that time. Uh, analysis was very difficult, so we uh, actually only looked at a few samples. Um, also with feces, it's known to be highly variable, um, but we didn't see significant differences in uh, short-chain fatty acids in just um, some samples. Uh, however, for, for the attack and RNA-seq data, there was a strong separation by tissue for the target tissues, liver and muscle, um, uh, for both attack-seq and RNA-seq as described this morning. But in the uh, maternal diet groups of piglets, all on the low fiber postpartum, uh, there were no uh, significant um, differences. The, um, the diets did give, um, among, uh, in th the diets did give uh, differences in, in um, uh, attack sec uh, data revealing uh, differentially accessible chromatin. And those uh, open regions appeared both in introns, intergenic regions, and also in promoters. So they were specifically looked for in transcription start sites, um, but also they were found um, in exons. And then, um, as, as described this morning, there was uh, an analysis of uh, open chromatin containing uh, diff differentially uh, uh, transcription fa factor activity between the cell diets. Um, so there's, there were, there's a few here indicated on the slide of Andrea this morning. Um, I think there are other transcription factors as well. There's no time to go into those, but um, potentially some of these are, have connections to some of the predicted uh, effects on physiology that I'll summarize and, um, and, and show now in the last few slides. Okay, so... Um, to look at the transcriptional data set, we needed to use gene set enrichment analysis, uh, which is a, a way of looking to see whether there is an enrichment of expressed genes in different gene ontology groups, indicating uh, different functions, effects on different functions. And that was the main approach uh, that we used. And I want to just summarize some of these findings. So taking, uh, for example, in piglets, the high fiber beat, uh, uh, diet versus the low fiber, we see um, an underexpression. Barrett, keep a, keep an eye on this heat map here. So the very red is uh, underexpression, not overexpression. Um, and um, these symbols indicate whether it was in the muscle, in the liver, or both. And in the immune response, you see a lot of effects here in the piglets. Now remember these, the differences uh, for these piglets were only the cell diet. Um, it is known from in vitro studies that uh, P. par gamma is um, 
is regulated by short chain fatty acids, and this is uh, epigenetically regulated transcription factor also involving GATA. Uh, so that could be uh, um, one of the explanations for some of these uh, 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 differences that we see in the immune response on low fiber versus high fiber. Um, and that was seen in both, um, both the uh, muscle and, and the liver. So thinking about some perspectives on this, um, inflammation uh, is, has, can have undesirable consequences. It might potentially exacerbate tissue damage to infections. Um, it may also impact on, for example, um, inf heightened inflammation as a consequence of stress postpartum. Um, the results indicate potential imprinting uh, of immune cells in the liver and in muscle in utero, uh, particularly the tissue resident cook for cells in the liver. Now, um, the liver sees higher concentrations than the other organs because the portal vein carrying short chain fatty acids goes first to the liver. Uh, so um, we, uh, it may explain why there are stronger effects in the liver than in the muscle. Um, it will also be important in the future to show if immune modulation is found in the periphery uh, and other organs. For example, we haven't looked at uh, serum markers and recent studies giving high fiber uh, diets to cells have shown differences in uh, some of the cytokines that are also seen in metabolic syndrome and heightened inflammation in humans. Um, there is a possibility that uh, the high fiber diet um, effects on immunity in the liver um, could be due to epigenetic changes altering uh, gene regulation in the intestine uh, because if the intestine is uh, due to inflammation slightly more permeable there will be more endotoxin going to the liver um, in the low fiber than in the high fiber. So those sorts of things we can't rule out. Um, if you look at um, at, uh, at the muscle or at the at the liver um, sorry I have to go back here if you look at the liver uh, we see um, increased expression of of uh, metabolic process and carboxylic acid process processes in the uh, and transport and uh, metabolism in the liver um, in the liver um, enriched expression of genes in these pathways is associated with Ontologies like fatty acid oxidation, carboxylic acid metabolism, this makes a lot of sense. Um, having increased circulation of short chain fatty acids going to the, to the liver through the portal vein. And um, it's been recently shown in in vivo studies that uh, piglets fed with high fiber diets uh, do induce uh, uh, more fatty acid oxidation. They, elev they activate AMP kinase and uh, as we uh, mentioned earlier in one of the introductory slides, this can have effects on the activity of histo histone acetylase, acetyl transferases. Um, when it comes to the muscle, um, we saw differences in uh, pathways involved in muscle structure and function. And um, this is an overexpression here. And um, also RNA processing and transcription regulation, and uh, some perspectives on that. So um, the, 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 these pathways indicate uh, possibly large effects on muscle physiology. There are ontology groups, for example, to do with the positive regulation of muscle contraction, ECM disassembly, which is due to the yeah, tissue growth, for example, uh, and remodeling of tissue. Um, other studies in short chain fatty acids have um, been shown to increase uh, fatty acid oxidation in muscle uh, glycogen levels, uh, probably due to gluconeogenesis increases, um, and also increased expression of type 1 myosin heavy chain proteins, suggesting uh, an increase in skeletal muscle tissues, both in vivo and um, also in in vitro, where studies have been done with short chain fatty acids. Um, these pathways are known to be activated again by the AMP kinase implicating acetate, uh, PPAR gamma, which is epigenetically regulated, and a uh, nuclear receptor ligand activated uh, transcription factor. Um, and uh, yeah, so we think we have a, a, um, a, some predict uh, a lot of 
physiological impact of these hyperfiber diets on the piglets, um, in muscle, in liver, and on the immune system, um, because we took those tissues mainly involving the immune cells associated with those tissues. And um, I'd like to just end up by acknowledging all the team of people here that working on the data that I've summarized and that was summarized this morning also by Elisabetta and Andrea. Uh, so at, at, at INRE uh, and INSERM uh, at Wageningen University, Diagenode for the sequencing, of course, the involvement of um, EMBL EBI in, in uploading all this data, which is available on the FANG uh, site for this project, GeneSwitch. Um, collaborators of Elisabetta in Aarhus and also uh, SFR, Scott Horse Speed Research, that um, uh, undertook the uh, animal experiment uh, with the cells and the piglets. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>